All right, folks, welcome to another glorious day of soil science and an online lecture. Before we actually get started with the PowerPoint, I wanted to go over a couple of things I've gotten a lot of questions about, which is awesome. Please feel free to ask all the questions you'd like. We like questions. That means we're engaging with you. Um, I know this first week was a bit rough. Um, I was out sick all week. I had to get tested and cleared in order to come back. So the poor GAs in your labs were kind of on their own for the first time teaching, which is not fun. So, so they did a great job considering the circumstance, but I just wanted to let you know that I will be here from here on out. And I apologize for any stress that caused. Don't worry. I'm about to answer a lot of the questions. I got an email. Help you figure out where everything is. We should be smooth sailings from here on out. So um, first thing is I need all of you to email me the name and contact phone number of somebody that I can call in the case of an emergency on your behalf. So we're, for example, this week we're going to go on a field trip and I need to have the name of someone to call in case something were to happen. I don't think anything is going to happen, but I still need you to send in the name and phone number via email to me of somebody that I can contact on your behalf uh, if something were to go wrong on the field trip. So please make sure that happens and I'll make an announcement in uh, Canvas on this as well. All right, I'm going to show you where to find lecture materials because I've had a lot of people um, struggle with that this week. So let me see, I need to go to share and then here. Okay, so in Canvas on your home screen here, I'll put it in student view because it's a little different for you than it is for me. So let me make sure that it's reflective of what you're going to see. All right, so here's what you see. When you go to your home button, you'll see the course syllabus, which hopefully answers a lot of your questions. Um, you'll see your first lab is listed here under the lab module. You can ignore these four files for now. We're going to utilize those when we go to the online portion of lab, um, but we're not going to do that yet. Week one lecture materials. So when Zoom crashed, I kind of was thrown back into WebEx and I recorded the very first lecture, but it comes up as an MP4 file. So I gave you the PowerPoint for that as well. After that, I decided that I can just record the PowerPoints live in PowerPoint. So here's where those are. Here's Introduction to Soils Part 2. If you open it and you put it into presentation mode, you'll start hearing the melodic sound of my voice. And the same thing for Soil Genesis. So this is all week one lecture materials. And at some point today, I will post uh, this day's lecture material in week two, and then I will update it with Wednesdays uh, when the time comes. And then uh, again, you'll have lab information. There's exam study guides. I really want to highlight these. Exam one is going to be in uh, several weeks, um, but we will, the way that I usually do this is as we get towards the end of exam one's material, which is the water chapter, I uh, will set schedules for exams for all students uh, that works best for you. Basically, we're going to take a class vote and determine when we're going to have our first exam as the time nears for the, us to finish the material. The reason I do that is because I want to make sure that you guys aren't overwhelmed with too many exams in one week. Um, it's not good for you. It's not good for me. You're just going to be overly stressed. So we will schedule this exam uh, around the time that we start finishing the material. Okay, so don't worry about that too much. But here's a whole bunch of Jeopardy PowerPoints that we're going to do in class. Um, I'm not sure how this is going to work yet since we're online, but we could do maybe some live Jeopardy something. I'm still working on that. But nonetheless, it's material to help you study for the first exam. I do a lot of study uh, prep for the first exam because it's your first time taking an exam with me and I know that that can be really stressful. Every teacher is different. I remember how stressful that was in college and I'm trying to make it easier on you. Here's the study guides for exam two and the final exam. Obviously you don't need those yet, but you know where to find them now. Let's see what else that I need to go over. 
Um, I'm going to come back to the PowerPoint. Let's see. Stop sharing that. And come back to. Just give me a second as I get us down to just one screen. There we go. So example, here's the learning objectives for today. It says soil taxonomy, pages 59 through 83. What you're going to do is if you have a different edition, is you're just going to go to your table of contents and you're going to look up soil taxonomy. Here's what I got to read. That's really it. I just want you to not spend $265 on a book. Um, the book is very, very, very helpful and I highly recommend you get it, but I'm not going to assign questions from it. Um, I'm just not going to do that. I think that that is really more high school level education um, or something that's really more helpful in maybe chemistry or biology courses. Um, I highly recommend you get any version of the book and do read it because it will help you learn in this class, but I'm not going to require it of you. Um, so I know I went over a lot of this on the first day, but I've still gotten so many emails I wanted to go all over. I wanted to go over this stuff again. Uh, where to submit labs. All right. So you're going to have to be patient with us because we have, for the first time, multiple labs. Um, and we have two GAs who, this is their first semester. So, uh, and I was gone the first week. So they were like drowning. Um, so we will, every week, we will create an online submission portal and it will not be due until a week after the lab. So anything you do this Wednesday isn't going to be due for a week. So if you have lab on Wednesday and we haven't uploaded somewhere for you to submit it by Friday, just know that we will and um, just, just hold on, we'll get there. <laughs> uh, it just takes a couple of days to get everybody uh, you know, with two different lab sections on the same timeline, okay? So there will be an online submission portal for every lab assignment when there is one. Um, and then, lab this week. If you do not have a way to transport yourself within Muncie, we're going to be meeting at a, a location off campus to go into a soil pit. So it's, uh, I'm going to put an announcement with the location. I'm also going to create a page on Canvas with videos to watch before we go and, uh, and, and the address, okay? It's like five minutes off campus. It's not super far. It's a, a property owned by Ball State called uh, Cooper Farm. It's at 5800 West Bethel Avenue. I'm going to post all that information online, but if you do not have a way to get yourself there, I need you to email me today, all right? So I need you to email me as soon as possible so that I can arrange transport for you, okay? It's about five minutes off campus. No worries. If you cannot drive yourself there, um, that's okay. For those of you that will be driving yourselves there, please, please, please park like you've parked in a parking lot before. The <laughs> When you get there, there's a tiny, tiny dirt lot. And the only way we're going to fit everybody in this class, I don't know why they make these teach such big classes. And I wish that it was economically uh, possible to teach classes of 10 people, but it's just not. So um, when you get into this lot, you, you're just going to have to park in two rows side by side and right up against, right behind somebody else's bumper. Okay. You're just, you're going to have to stack cars and you're going to have to park perfectly next to each other. So if you can't park perfectly, perfectly next to each other, back out and straighten yourself back up because otherwise not everybody's going to fit. There's a second driveway. If you get there and, and people have parked in a weird way, please go to the second driveway and park by the barn. Okay. Uh, it's like the only house across from a medical center. So you're not going to have a hard time finding it. And I'll be there with a bullhorn, like welcoming you in my all ridiculous fashion. All right. So. Um, let me check and make sure there aren't people asking me things in the chat. There we go. Uh, we classify soil because there's different properties in soil as we move across the landscape and as we move across depths that are really important for management decisions down the road. And when we get to the land use classification um, project, you'll really understand why these are so important. So. In a particular landscape, there's different land 
positions, right? There's the summit and there's the back slope and there's the toe slope and there's the floodplain. Don't ever build a house in a floodplain. Um, all of these things give rise to different soils. And as we go through a soil profile, we look at a polypedon, which is a group of similar pedons classified as a soil individual. So we're going to pull out this one individual soil unit shown right here, six foot in depth, and we're going to classify it. And that's what we're going to do in lab this week. We're going to actually look at it and we're going to differentiate the various horizons, okay? Which, by the way, you're absolutely going to need mud boots this week, unless you like really hate your shoes and your socks. Um, there are some mud boots in the lab. Um, and I will bring them, but there will probably not be enough for everyone, and they're all various sizes, and I'm going to have to disinfect them in between each lab, and um, just if you have mud boots, please bring them. If you are an NREM or a geology major, invest now. You're going to need them. Um, so we're going to describe a pedon, which is the small sampling unit that displays a full range of properties that are characteristic of an individual soil. So essentially, all this fancy work word over here, wording, it just means that we dig a hole and we look at six feet of soil and we classify all the differences in it. And then based on a set of characteristics, we're going to apply a taxonomic name, just like you would if you were taxing out a plant in botany, or if you were taxing out an animal in biology. Okay, so we've just designed a classification system based on known properties. So the keys to soil taxonomy is the abbreviated version of a very, very, very large purple book you can actually get for free. If you ever want to take the upper scale division version of soil taxonomy, um, it's offered in the spring and it's really fun because we travel all over the United States to look at soils and I'm really fun on road trips because I sing the whole time, just letting you know that in advance. Uh, we basically had a need to classify, understand, and organize soils so that we can make interpretations of land management. Can we build a road here? Can we build a house here? Would this be good for farming? Uh, can we put a sidewalk here? What kind of water will this absorb uh, or not absorb? Is it prone to erosion? All of these things are kind of what we include in our classification system, the management principles behind classifying soil. So we came up with this whole system in 1938, way before I was born. Um, the rationale for creating the system uh, was based on the properties of soils that we find today. Physical properties, chemical properties, biological properties, things like texture of the soil, basically how much sand, silt, or clay was there. What color is the soil? What is the structure of the soil? Uh, what is the pH of the soil? What is the organic matter content of the soil? We've, we uh, included things that you haven't learned yet called percent uh, base saturation, which is basically the saturation of certain ions that are important for growing plants. Uh, how, what type of clay? So we send samples off to discover mineralogy and what minerals are present, what's the actual chemical formula uh, involved here. Iron oxides and how, how often they're prevalent in each horizon. Uh, we diagnose the surface horizon, which is the epipedon, uh, you can think of epipedon as epidermis, like the surface of your skin. Endopedons are the subsurface horizon, so we're going deep into the soil. We're no longer at the surface. We're down in the depth, Johnny. And this is ultimately what we end up coming up with. We come up with a description of a soil where at the surface we have a plowed surface horizon it goes from zero to nine inches. The color is dark brown. The texture is silt loam. We have granular structure, which is very friable, meaning it's soft and easily um, crushed. Many to fine roots. We have a neutral pH, and we have something called a clear smooth boundary, meaning the transition between the AP and the BT1 horizon is smooth and easy to see. All right, and so then it goes through to describe uh, a series of B horizons with a little T symbol. Now, tell me in the chat what the lowercase T stands for in a BT horizon, if you can remember from last week. 
Lowercase t stands for an accumulation of what? As everybody scrambles to go through their notes. Crickets. I hear crickets. <laughs> I'm failing you. None of you know. <laughs> I'm not actually failing you, like, as in giving you an F. I mean, like, I am failing you as a professor if you don't know this. <laughs> okay, lowercase t indicate. Yes! Oh, saving! Saving the day! Thank you! Awesome! It means an accumulation of play. Okay, so here we have four horizons that have an accumulation of play. A BT1, a BT2, a BT3, and a BT4. And the reason that we have four different play horizons are because maybe they have different colors. For example, the first BT horizon is a reddish brown color, but the second one is just solid red. The third one is dark red. Uh, the fourth one is also dark red, but you see there's a difference in texture. Here, here we have silty clay versus the BT horizon above it has silty clay loam. Basically, there's a difference in play percentage. So as we go deeper, generally, we see a pick up in clay, more clay. So it makes sense that we would move from a silty clay loam into a silty clay. BC horizons. These are a transitional horizon that is both a, a horizon of accumulation, but also a horizon of parent material. Okay, and so we put this here. Now, in this instance, we have limestone bedrock at the base of the, of the entire profile, meaning this is expected to identify the parts. If I give you a long name like this, I would say, hey, what is the order? Or underline the family, okay? But I'm not going to expect you to say, oh, I understand what fine mix superactive means. I know what a glosso, great, no, I'm not going to ask you to do those things, okay? All right. So organization of soil taxonomy, again, we're going to focus on the 12 orders. But first, I'm going to give you the general definition of what all the parts to soil taxonomy mean. Okay, so orders, starting with orders. They're the most general classification. There's 12 of them. Uh, here's a poster you can get for your wall. It's free. Uh, there's the link down here for you to click on to get it. Uh, I know all of you are like, so wanting to just ditch class to go order this poster for your dormitory wall because having the 12 soil orders on your wall has probably been a lifelong dream. Um, but but hold fast. You, there's always time after class. I, I know. Hold yourself back. I understand. I understand. The passion is real. Um, but these are very broad general properties that are defining uh, the soil. Okay. And then there's suborders, which basically further defines the soil based on characteristics related to soil moisture or soil temperature or the dominant chemical and textural features. Things such as moisture regime. Great groups takes those suborders and differenti differentiates them further based on the horizons or other soil features. Subgroups takes those great groups and then divides them even further uh, on other properties that may be common or um, not common, or uh, we're not gonna get into super big detail on subgroups, but families uh, give divisions based on the dominant texture, mineralogy, and temperature regime. For example, the Miami soil order is, is usually found in Indiana. You can do a fun thing. I know you're all just dying to do fun things. Um, and you can put in your name. So my name is Jessica, but it's spelt weird, so I shorten it to Jesse. And then soil description into Google. So your name, soil description, and then see if something comes up. We're going to skip this because I don't care about it. All right, so in review, we have order, suborder, great group, subgroup, family, series. So in this case, order is IBS, and we'll, we'll learn here in a little while what that means. The suborder is calc. The great, I'm sorry, I 
Yes. The great group is haplo. Oh, come on. Haplo. Okay. The subgroup is oustic. Now, the family here is really long, okay? It's fine, sandy loam, coarse loamy mix, super active mesic. It's really long. They're not always this long. This one's just complicated and weird. And the series here is Mavita. Main state soil. ODS is the order. Suborder is orth. The great group is Hapl. The subgroup is Aquic. If my computer would function, Aquic. And then the family here is Silt Loam, Coarse Loamy, Isotic, Frigid. The series is Chess and Cook. Now let's try the Washington State soil. The order is Ans. The suborder is Zer. The great group is Vitre. The subgroup is Aquic. The family is Gravelly, Medial, Loam, Medial, Amorphic, Mesic. And the series is Tokel. All right. So that is really what you need to know in terms of soil taxonomic names is what each chunk of the weird names mean. All right, so let's dive into the 12 soil orders. Here's a great graphic from the book that kind of gives you uh, a quick look at the 12 soil orders. You can see entosols are the most recently formed. Histosols are made of organic material. Gelosols are made of permafrost meaning they're cold all the time. Aridosols are dry, arid, desert. Alphasols are mildly acidic clay soils. Ultisols are strongly acidic clay soils. Oxisols are basically our tropical soils, which are extremely weathered and very red, and they will totally stain your pants. So know that if you go to Hawaii, you need to wear pants you don't care about. Spodosols, they actually even in Hawaii, they even have an entire company based on their soils. It's called the Red Dirt Company, and they sell things like the original dirt bag and clothes that are dyed by red clays from there. And do not ever wash any of those items with any other items that you care about because the red clay will stain them. Not that I know from experience. <clears throat> Spodosols have a spodic horizon. They form in cool, wet, sandy, coniferous forests. They're very acidic. Mollusols are my favorite. Mollusol means soft, dark. Uh, they form in semi-arid to moist grasslands. They have a mollic epipenon. We'll learn what that means. And we're gonna we're about to go over slides on each one of these with this information. So don't freak out um, if you can't write down all of this fast enough. Um, Vertisols are swelling clays. They have a high base saturation. Um, a very active clays that are shrinking and swelling. These are our problem children's soils. You do not want to build on a vertisol. They cause all kinds of issues. They will move chimneys off houses. They will crack foundations. They will move roads. Um, if you're in construction management, write down vertisols are bad <laughs> because they are. They're very, 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 very bad. They're trouble, trouble, trouble. I love them though because they're really fun to look at. And septisols. Uh, these are basically your teenage aged soils, okay? They're mildly weathered uh, and they occur under various conditions. They're basically like kind of developed soils, but not super, super developed soils. Andosols are formed from volcanic ash. So that's a quick overview of the 12 soil orders. Now let's go into them in greater depth. All right. See the big blinking words? Know these? You're going to need to understand what these little abbreviations refer to. Entisols are abbreviated as ent at the end of the soil taxonomic name. So if a soil taxonomic name ends in ENT, you know the soil order is an entisol. 
this is important for you to know because I will put a giant, long, scary looking taxonomic name on the exam and I'll ask you to tell me what the soil order is. And you'll just look to those last few letters and you'll say, oh, it ends in OD. That means it's a spodosol. Oh, it ends in IST. That means it's a histosol. Okay, so make sure you write these down. These are very, 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 very important. All right, so our young soils, entosols, are represented by ENT, ENT. Inceptosols are represented by EPT, EP. Andosols are represented by AND. Aridosols are represented by ID, ID. Gelosols are represented by L, EL. Vertisols are represented by ERT, ERT. Mature soils are our mollusols, which are represented by OL, OLL. Alphasols are represented by ALF, ALF. Our old soils, these ones are our ultasols represented by ult, as in ultimately weathered. Spodosols, odd, as in oddly weathered. Oxisols, as in ox. I don't really have a funny thing to say for that one. Ox, eh. <laughs> Organic soils are our histosols, represented by ist. Just gonna check the chat, make sure you... So let's go over each one of these soil orders in greater detail. Entosols are most recently formed, ent for recent. They generally only have an A horizon over a series of C horizons. Okay, they generally have something called an ochreic epipedon at the surface, which is a light covered, a light colored surface horizon. These are found on or with inert parent materials or very pure limestone or landscapes that have very little time to develop, such as active floodplains where there's constant redeposition before any soil formation can really occur, or poor climactic conditions, such as the desert tundra, where there's not a lot of water to move things throughout the so soil profile, so it doesn't really develop into much. Okay, so basically, entosols are very young soils without much development, meaning an A horizon over a series of C horizons. Inceptosols uh, are represented by ept from inceptus, which is the Latin term for beginning. These are immature soils, okay? They're more developed than the endosol, but not by much, okay? They have weak development. They're like the teenagers or the preteens of the soil world. They also have an ochreic surface horizon, which is usually thin and doesn't have a lot of color. It doesn't have a lot of organic matter accumulation or anything special to it. Um, we have something called a cambic subsurface, which is represented by a BW horizon, meaning a, surf a subsurface soil that has very weak development. Okay, we have a series of B horizons with very weak development, meaning there might be a little change in color, but we don't see a lot of movement of things through the soil profiles. We don't see leaching. We don't see um, really any significant soil development. It's weakly developed, okay? These are recent deposits or formed on parent material that's resistant to weathering or, or basically becoming a soil. Um, sometimes these are a function of erosion or uh, climate. Uh, we see these in tundras and in mountains, for example. We can also see these on uplifted floodplains. So floodplains that are no longer active, but have not been uplifted long enough to really develop. Or maybe they're somewhere where there's not enough rainfall to further develop them from what they were. So we see weak development. Andosols, and come from ando, which is Japanese for volcanic ash soil. Uh, funny story, when I took soil science um, as a student, my professor was Greek and he had a really hard time saying ash. So it sounded super inappropriate and we would always laugh and he would get really mad at us. And then finally he just laughed with us and said, listen, I can't speak your language. I don't care. This is what I'm going to say. And this is what I mean. And we kind of all just kumbaya on from there. Um, young soils are what the andosols are. 
and they have low bulk density, high porosity. Uh, they're very susceptible to wind erosion um, because they're, you know, it's basically fluffy ash that can blow away in the wind. And uh, it's generally made up of amorphous, poorly crystalline irons and aluminum minerals. Um, but these are very productive soils. Don't be confused. Uh, any kind of burnt material mineralizes a lot of nutrients and makes them more easily taken up by plants. And so usually we see, you know, there's these old wives tales where you would um, burn things and then put, put the ashes in your garden because it would help it be more productive. Well, that's to be said of andesols as well. They're very productive soils because um, they're just made of all kinds of awesome nutrients from all that ash content. But they can be hydrophobic, which can be problematic. Um, we see these in Hawaii, the Pacific Northwest, and along the Pacific Rim. They're really beautiful soils. You can see here that we have a lot of um, ash deposits in this soil in the upper right. And you see a variety of layers of differing colors because of that. And so in some cases, andesols can be just absolutely stunning. I know you never thought you'd think of soil as stunning, but stick with me, kid. I'll show you the way. All right, aridosols. Aridosols um, are represented by id, which comes from aridus for dry. So these are developed in periods uh, in areas with only short wet periods, meaning not a lot of rainfall. We're talking desert type climate. Uh, there's little leaching of base cations because of this. Uh, basically, there's stock full of cations because there's no water to move them anywhere. There's no water to take them out of the profile. So they end up having very low organic matter because there aren't a lot of fibrous plants growing at the surface and, and dying to put organic matter back in the soil. Um, what plants do survive there survive on very little water and generally live for very long periods of time and don't have really deep root systems because of that. They don't have fibrous root systems. Uh, they basically are not going to be adding organic matter to the soil. So we see low organic matter meaning very light colored surfaces here because of that. We also see a lot of salt accumulation at the surfaces of aridosols because there's not a lot of water to wash the salts away. And what little water does come to the surface evaporates very quickly and leaves salt residue behind. And in normal soils, that those um, salts would get washed throughout the profile. But here there's not enough water to do that. They evaporate too quickly to move water through the soil profile. And so these soils are also characterized by ochreic surface head-ons, which are very light in color. Gelosols, L, which comes from the Latin gelaire, meaning to freeze. Uh, these are very young soils with very little development. They're cold and frozen most of the year. Uh, they form in a permafrost. And their diagnostics um, have layers that remain in a temperature of less than zero degrees Celsius for more than two consecutive years. So basically, they're really, really, really freaking cold and <laughs> they're frozen all the time. It's a giant block of frozen soil um, down to 100 centimeter depth for more than two years at a time. I mean, it's just crazy to think that soils could even develop in that situation. So you can imagine where you would find these, you know up in Alaska and Antarctica, those kinds of places where it's cold all the time, that's where you'll find gelosols. So in the chat, I want you to tell me what entosols and inceptosols have in common. Vertisols are uh, described as ert for Latin, verto, which means to turn. Now, what's interesting about vertisols are that they have these expansive clays. And what happens with these expansive clays is they dry out and they shrink down in size. And so these giant cracks form. And then during this time period, parts of the soil fill in those cracks. Like little eroded bits of soil from the surface fill in those cracks. Now those cracks can go down like three feet. Okay, so we see basically all that soil from the surface get crumbled into the cracks down to like three feet depth. So we see these spikes of surface soils getting thrown down into 
various depths of the profile. And then the rain comes and the soil expands and gets bigger. Okay. And it starts moving the soil horizons with it as it makes room for that expanded area because those cracks filled up. So it can't just fill up the crack again. So it starts turning itself upside down. And what we end up seeing is this crazy profile of like turns and movements and, and things that should be at the surface are now with random spirals in the middle and none of it makes sense. There aren't any defined horizons because of this. It does not look like, it no longer looks like a cake with perfect horizons, okay? It looks like an absolute mess, like a three-year-old got into the cake and smashed it to bits and then tried to reform it to make it look like nobody just smashed the cake, okay? That's basically what we end up with here. So we end up with high expansion and contraction, self-mixing properties, poor horizonation, sometimes exceptionally deep surfaces because of the, the inverting and turning that happens, and something called Gilgai topography, um, and something called slick and slides. Now I'll get to Gilgai topography in a second, but slick and slides are basically where there is so much clay in those horizons that they slip on each other and they create a really smooth surface, a, a slipping plane, if you will. And it literally looks like somebody wiped it clean and, and just smoothed it out. And it makes it very, very, very difficult to manage any kind of soil that has enough clay to do that. That's a great question, Saban. Um, generally speaking, we cannot call it a slick and slide unless we see it. So I guess technically you would call it a slick and slide once it's exposed. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess, yes. Good question. Make sure I answer. We're man on time. I'm almost out of time. Okay, so this is what a typical mollusol landscape looks like. Alpha sols um, are alf for pedalfer, aluminum, 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 and iron complexes are in them. Um, generally speaking, they have an ochre gepped on. They can have other ones, but generally they'll have an ochre gepped on, meaning a light, mostly worthless surface profile. Uh, they'll have well-developed horizons. And most importantly, this is what I want you to remember about our alpha sols, okay? They have subsurface clay accumulations that has more than 35% base saturation, meaning these are the soils that have a bunch of clay, but they're still very fertile, okay? They're, they're not as fertile as mollusols, but they're still pretty fertile. So when I say alpha sol, I want you to remember clay subsurface, not as badly leached. And I say this because there's another soil order we're going to learn about that is very similar to alpha sols, but it is much more leached and not as fertile. Okay, so when I say alpha sols, I want you to remember clay subsurface with greater than 35% base saturation. Okay, generally these were forested areas. They might not be forested anymore, um, or they are currently forested, and it's usually deciduous forest. Okay. So typical alpha sol landscapes now are generally used for agriculture because they're prized uh, for their production ability. They're not as productive as mollusols, but they're almost as productive as mollusols. Ultisols are very, very similar to alpha sols, okay? Ult comes from Latin ultimus, meaning the last ultimate, ultimately weathered. Ultisols have subsoil clay accumulation. Sounds familiar, right? Except it's very, 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 very leached and very acidic and very hard to make it productive, okay? So it has less than 35% base saturation. So ultimately, alpha sols and ultisols both have subsurface BT horizons or subsurface clay accumulation, but alpha sols are still fertile and have more than 35% base saturation, and all the sols are ultimately weathered and have less base saturation, less than 35% base saturation. So they're almost the same soil order, but one is more productive and one is less productive. Does that make sense? So when we're talking about mollusols and alpha sols, how do we tell them apart? What is the base saturation difference?
All right. We're almost done. Spodosols. Odd for Greek spodos for wood ash. High sand content. Ochric epipedon. Usually have an albic or white leached e horizon. A spodic horizon. These are very acidic, very leached, very low base saturation. Basically, infertile soils. Okay, they're they're honestly almost worthless. But <laughs> Despite all of the terrible things about spodosols, soil scientists love them, and it's really for selfish reasons, okay? We love spodosols because they're like the unicorns of soil. They're really difficult to find, they're, they're very rare, and they're absolutely stunning, okay? They're absolutely beautiful because they form these really leached e-horizons that are very light in color. All right, folks, that's it for today. I'm going to let you free, and I will be posting lecture at some point tonight, and then you can take a second look. Please don't forget to email me your emergency contact information. Have a great day, and I will catch you later.